And now I'm going to bring in uh, Dr. Salmi. He is, if you guys have Lecturio and you've seen a lot of our anatomy lectures, he does a ton of them for both medical and nursing. He's a clinical assistant professor of pathology and surgery at Stanford University, and he has put together this awesome presentation for us today. So I'm going to hand it over to him, and I'll just be in the background answering you guys' questions if you have any. Thanks for being here. Fantastic. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here in front of such a large group of boy, yeah, people from all over. I was checking that chat too, and uh, Poland, Nigeria, Guatemala, everywhere. Uh, and a nice mix too. It looks like um, you know, about like half our med students, half our non-med students. We got a nice uh, cohort of nursing students. And, you know, as Nurse Liz mentioned, uh, I do a little bit of both. So uh, you might see me in the nursing anatomy, you might see in the med student anatomy and the slides we're going to look at today are kind of pulled from those more in-depth anatomy lectures. But what we're going to do today, because we only have a very brief amount of time, is we're going to have a focused sort of preview, maybe slash review for some of you who've already done some anatomy, specifically regarding the anatomy that's related to chest pain. And in doing so, we're going to talk about, you know, the anatomic structures within and around the chest. And when we say chest pain, you probably jump to cardiac pain, which makes sense, right? There's a lot of reasons why you think that. A lot of it is, has to do with just how serious cardiac causes of chest pain can be. But we're going to cover cardiac, but also non-cardiac anatomy slash causes of chest pain. And in doing so, we're going to sort of practice going through a differential diagnosis through a couple case studies, mini case studies, more like patient presentations, and kind of make the connection that, especially if you're early on or have yet to begin your training in healthcare fields, really understand like how the anatomy connects directly into these clinical presentations, right? And so that's the point of learning anatomy is because we apply it all the time in our practice, whether that's nursing, medical, other healthcare fields, PA and P, you know, it's foundational. You know, it's the body. We're treating bodies and we got to know what parts are in the body in order to know where things are going wrong and how to fix them. So we're going to start with the chest. What does that even mean, right? So that can mean a lot of things, especially this is a patient who doesn't have the kind of training y'all are going to have when it comes to describing their pain, right? So when they say chest pain, just kind of a silly example, but not really. You know, might have a friend or somebody who just does a hundred push-ups in a row and says, ah, I'm having like chest pain. And that's not really what we think of. You might think, well, you really have soreness in your pec major, some anatomy for you, right? More upper limb anatomy. And that's, you know, kind of the vagueness when we say chest pain. Like, that's not really what you all are probably thinking of when we say chest pain. But to someone who doesn't have the anatomic knowledge that you all have or soon will have, that could be a perfectly logical, logical way of explaining it. I have pain in the region between my neck and my abdomen, right? And that's pretty vague. So chest pain itself can mean a lot of things, right? So there's a lot of causes for chest pain. Do we mean like the chest wall, the physical structures around the chest cavity, like things we can touch? Or do we really mean the stuff inside the chest cavity where we have a couple really vital organs like the lungs and the heart, of course? So in going through chest anatomy, however we kind of think of that very broadly, it's gonna serve as the basis for how we formulate our differential diagnosis or the things that we're gonna be thinking about when someone comes in with this chief complaint of chest pain. Let's start with that chest wall, the outside part of our chest cavity, the part that you probably don't jump to right away when you think of the term chest pain. Well, we have this like really strong support structure around our chest cavity kind of loosely we call the rib cage. Now the rib cage isn't entirely ribs. Of course, if we look posteriorly, we have these very important bones back there making up our vertebral column to which the ribs attach posteriorly. And then anteriorly, we can see there's this midline set of bones here that we call the sternum. And the superior most part, we call the manubrium, 
this large part in the minute the middle we call the body and there's a pointy thing at the bottom we call the xiphoid process and yeah you know you can memorize these things if you have a really great memory i don't so i need tricks to help me know this rather than memorize it and what do i mean i kind of learn what these words mean so these words are kind of helpful once you know what they mean for example xiphoid means sword like I'm like, well that kind of makes sense to me because we just described it as this pointy thing at the bottom of the sternum so xiphoid or sword like oh that, that's that's pretty easy to remember what the pointy thing at the bottom of the sternum is going to be called similarly manubrium means handle and now it really is making sense because it kind of looks like it's the handle of a sword that's up pointing upside down so that's the first part we're going to talk about we have that sternum part in the midline and on either side of the sternum we have some cartilage we call costal cartilage so costal this is another good time to dive into those words costal refers to ribs so when you see costal kind of automatically replace in your mind costal with rib so this is rib related cartilage and at the inferior margin here we see that it forms this this rim here or arch of cartilage it's called the costal margin and that's going to be sort of our inferior edge at least from the anterior point of view of our chest cavity we'll tilt a little bit to sort of a lateral view to see the ribs themselves a little bit better and we actually see that only the first seven ribs kind of fit this model of what we consider a true rib so we say the first seven ribs here are true ribs because they start at the vertebra go all the way around the chest cavity have a costal cartilage they attach to that attaches to the sternum we can see all right that's the same for two three four five six seven but by the time we get to rib eight we see something's a little different so these ribs we call false ribs because as you can see here with rib eight its costal cartilage has to attach to the costal cartilage of rib seven above it similar for the ones below it so rib nine is going to attach to a costal cartilage that attaches to the costal cartilage of rib eight which in turn attaches to the costal cartilage of rib seven so those ribs that i just described only indirectly attach to the sternum and then in particular these last two way down here ribs 11 and 12 we can see don't attach to costal cartilage and therefore the sternum at all so those are floating ribs a subset of the false ribs and then finally we know that we're gonna seal off this thoracic cavity or chest cavity from the abdominal cavity by the presence of our diaphragm and i can't help throwing in a little bit of embryology because i also teach embryology and i think if you really really want to understand anatomy you kind of have to know how it formed in the first place and we actually start out early in development with one single body cavity and it's the diaphragm that comes along and separates it into a separate thoracic and abdominal cavity or in other words a separate pleural and peritoneal cavity and I say that because we're going to talk about the pleural lining of the chest cavity, which is pretty much the exact same thing as the peritoneal lining of the abdominal cavity. All right, so that's kind of the boundaries of like what's holding the chest cavity inside. So what's what's inside? Well, let's talk about that pleura thing. So if we imagine a cross section here where we have a, an example of our lungs, we see that the lungs on their surface have this thing called visceral pleura and so this is something called a serous membrane serous means watery so it's something that's producing a watery fluid and it's visceral because it's on the viscera it's on the surface of an organ so when you see visceral viscera it usually means like related to an organ and this has a very thin lining of cells called mesothelial cells i also can't help but throw in a little histology because i also teach that and this lining goes all around the surface of the lung 
And you can see here, it doubles back and goes from green to blue. And it does so at this little indentation of the lung called the hilum, where structures enter and exit. Things like the bronchus, pulmonary artery, pulmonary veins, etc. And as that serous membrane comes off and attaches to the surrounding chest cavity, we have the parietal pleura. And so we have that colored in blue. Parietal means like, like wall. So this is the, the wall of the chest cavity as opposed to the surface of the organ. And that parietal versus visceral explanation, adjective usage is the same when you get down in the abdomen, you talk about parietal peritoneum and visceral peritoneum. Parietal peritoneum would be lining the wall of the abdominal cavity and visceral pleura would be something like lining the outside surface of your small intestine, for example. And between these two layers, you have a little tiny space with typically just a little bit of fluid. And why would you have that? Well, even though this is a static image, we know that the lungs don't just sit there, right? They're not, you know, the liver that just kind of one size all the time. The lungs are inflating and contracting. So they're always changing shape. So they're always moving, right? Well, they're hopefully always moving because that's how we breathe, right? So that pleural fluid that exists in the pleural cavity decreases that friction between the visceral and parietal layers of our pleura. What about the lungs themselves, right? So let's sort of do a little x-ray vision through the lungs to see what's going on inside, at least to the point we can still see grossly or with the naked eye. A lot of the real important structures like alveoli are gonna be microscopic. So here we see the trachea coming down and splitting into left and right main bronchus. And they're going in and delivering air, air in and air out, right? So the bronchi are going to branch into many, many, many tiny branches, eventually down to little, little tiny alveoli. And alongside them, we're going to see branches of the pulmonary artery. And those two things branch together because that's essentially what an alveolus is, a tiny layer of epithelium and a tiny, tiny capillary in order for gas exchange to take place. And notice these are pulmonary arteries and I'm pointing to the blue things. And you probably typically think of arteries as being drawn red and veins as blue. Well, that's true outside of the lungs, but we don't really define arteries and veins by whether they carry oxygenated blood or deoxygenated blood. We mean if it's going away from the heart or coming towards the heart. And in the case of the lungs, pulmonary arteries are going away from the heart in order to get oxygenated in the lungs. That's why the pulmonary arteries are labeled in blue and the pulmonary veins, which have now just been oxygenated and are coming back to the heart, are colored red. So it's a little different than it is pretty much everywhere else in the body. And again, all of these structures enter and exit at this little indentation on the medial aspect of the lungs called the hilum. Next, we're gonna look at the digestive system. Like, wait, why would the gastrointestinal system, we're talking about chest pain, and when you think digestion and gastrointestinal uh, system, your mind probably jumps straight to the abdomen. And granted, that's where the majority of the digestive system or the gastrointestinal system is going to be located. But I think it's good to remember that it actually begins up in the head and neck anatomy area with the mouth or oral cavity which leads into the pharynx before finally becoming this long skinny tube, the esophagus, which is really the thoracic part of the gastrointestinal or digestive system. Because now it's the job of the esophagus to bridge the gap from mouth and pharynx all the way down past the diaphragm and into the abdomen so it can deliver that food bolus, for example, into the stomach. Here we see a little lateral view of the esophagus and how it's really traversing the chest cavity here. If we zoom in at the proximal region, we see just how closely our respiratory structures are related to our digestive structures. 
Here we see the larynx giving way to the trachea, which will eventually bifurcate or split into two bronchi to supply the lungs. And just around that same area, in fact, even just going posterior to the larynx, we have the pharynx, which will finally terminate around the level the larynx ends and become the esophagus. And you can see the esophagus and trachea sort of go down together all the way until the trachea splits off into bronchi. And again, I just can't resist pointing this out, but if you haven't learned this yet, you should go check out some cool embryology about how the trachea and bronchi and lungs develop. They actually develop off of the primitive precursor of the esophagus. So it's no coincidence these two tubes are sitting side by side like this. Turns out the trachea developed off of the esophagus. But if you're not eating anything, the pharynx and the esophagus are usually cut off from each other by a closed upper esophageal sphincter, right? Kind of makes sense. You know, most of the time, the esophagus should be empty. Similarly, if we go distally past the diaphragm, which has been faded out so we can look down into the abdomen to see the stomach, we're going to have a lower esophageal sphincter at that junction between esophagus and stomach, also called the gastroesophageal junction or the GE junction. Same thing, it will just kind of relax when a food bolus, for example, needs to make its way out of the esophagus and into the stomach. All right, and finally, we're gonna actually talk about the heart. You know, again, I would assume when you hear the term chest pain, your mind immediately goes to the heart. So we will talk about it, but actually before we even talk about the heart, we have to talk about the sac in which the heart sits inside this portion of the chest we call the mediastinum, the middle part of the chest cavity. So the heart doesn't just sit around the chest cavity somewhat exposed, if you will, it's in this pericardial sac. And here it's been faded out so that you can see the heart underneath it. But the pericardium, if we were to zoom in a little bit, has a lot going on. So for example, in this zoomed in view, we see the myocardium or the muscle, the working muscle of the heart. You know, that's what the heart is, right? It's a very special type of muscle, very important muscle, but still it's mostly muscle. So we have the myocardium that's going to end in epicardium. Epi means upon, it's sort of the outermost part. And that epicardium is going to be covered with visceral pericardium. Again, visceral means on the surface of an organ. Just like visceral pleura was the pleura right on the surface of the lung, the visceral pericardium is the pericardium right on the surface of the heart, not the stuff on the outer sac of the pericardium. And we also throw in for good measure, we specify serous pericardium. Again, serous means watery. And there's a reason we call it serous because this pericardium makes a little watery substance. Now, if we look on the sac that surrounds the heart, we see, we get the same naming nomenclature. We have a parietal layer. Again, what would you say of the serous pericardium? And again, serous means watery. So in between these two visceral and parietal layers of serous pericardium, we have a small amount typically of pericardial fluid. Same idea as the pleural fluid was in the lungs, right? The heart, hopefully, is always beating. And so it's not a static organ, it's always moving. And this pericardial fluid reduces the friction between these two layers of pericardium. And that's why we throw in sometimes that, that extra word serous as a reminder that we're talking about these layers here on either side of the fluid. But if we were to go to the outer surface of this parietal pericardium, we would find it's very, very tough. And that would be the fibrous pericardium, a lot of collagen fibers, a lot of connective tissue. And so that is really more the strong supportive aspect of the pericardium 
rather than the inner layer that's making this nice little bits of fluid for us. We're gonna just really, really quickly go through the outer surface of the heart itself after we've taken that pericardial sac off so we can see it. And we're gonna go kind of like imagining where some deoxygenated blood coming in from some vein in the shoulder, for example, on its way to the heart to then get up to the lungs, then come back to the heart and then go out to systemic circulation throughout the body again. So that means we're gonna start by looking at the two big veins on the right side of the heart, which are the superior vena cava or SVC and the inferior vena cava or the IVC. And these very large veins are receiving deoxygenated blood kind you usually expect in a vein, and delivering it into the first chamber of the heart, the right atrium, which we can see a little bit of here. Then the right atrium is going to feed into the right ventricle, which in turn is going to pump out into the pulmonary artery to go to the lungs to get oxygenated. Now, it's gonna go do its thing break down all the way to the level of an alveolus, get oxygenated, come back via pulmonary veins and into the uh, left atrium. But we can't really see it so well here. And that's because in an anterior view of the heart, the heart doesn't sort of sit just like very symmetrically. It's a little tilted such that an anterior view shows mostly right-sided structures. So we do see a little tiny bit of one pulmonary vein and a little bit of the left atrium there but mostly we see just a little bit of the left ventricle that the left atrium feeds into. And again, that's, that's normal. Um, we can also see where we make the division, just even from the external surface of the heart between left and right ventricle. Now we know, or maybe we'll learn that if you haven't learned it already, we know that inside there's a wall between these two ventricles that's called the interventricular septum or sometimes just a ventricular septum. But how would you know from the outside where that wall is exactly located? Well, as you can see here, the surface here or the epicardium has a little bit more fat and you can faintly make out a little vessel or two in there, which we're gonna learn is a very particular type of coronary artery lies in there, a very important one. So that's a landmark we can actually see externally and know that we're separating the right ventricle from the left ventricle at about this area. And again, the heart's a little tilted so that the pointy part of the heart or cardiac apex points down and to the left. Now, if you get into learning about congenital heart diseases, you'll learn that there are variations to where that apex can point and other sorts of things might make that pointy apex less pointy. For example, if a heart dilates in something like heart failure or dilated cardiomyopathy, but in our typical anatomic situation, it's this pointy part of the left ventricle that points down and to the left. Now we left off with our left ventricle, which is receiving this oxygenated blood very recently oxygenated blood from the left atrium. And then it's going to be pumping out the ascending aorta before it starts to arch as the aortic arch and then descend somewhat on the left side of midline as the descending aorta. And before it does that, it's gonna give rise to some very important vessels such as the brachiocephalic trunk it's another thing where if you kind of break down that word, it's helpful to know what it's doing. Brachiocephalic, brachium meaning arm, cephalic meaning head. So that in turn is gonna give rise to our common carotid, supplies the head and neck, and our subclavian artery that supplies the upper limb. Now, as you keep going, the branches for those same vessels on the left side come directly off of the aortic arch. We have the left common carotid artery, and then the left subclavian artery. Doing the same thing, it's just that the right ones come off of this trunk. And if we were to open up the aortic valve, we would see, and then sort of like cut through it and then open it up to see it all displayed in front of us, we would see three 
little half moon or semi-lunar shaped valves that help prevent backflow from the ascending aorta back into the left ventricle. And we would notice on the right cusp, a little hole called the right coronary ostium. Ostium is just our fancy anatomy word for hole. And this is the opening for our right coronary artery. Similarly, on the left coronary cusp, we would see, uh, sorry, the left cusp of the aortic valve, we would see a hole called the left coronary ostium, and that'll be the opening for our left coronary artery. And this one here, which is the posterior cusp, you know, if you were looking from above, you would see right, left, and posterior. The other term for the posterior cusp of the aortic valve is actually called the non-coronary cusp, and you can see why. It doesn't have any ostium here. They're on the other cusps. So posterior and non-coronary mean the same thing. We're referring to this cusp of the aortic valve. Now these ostia are very important. As you can imagine, these are the openings, right? These are the openings into the coronary arteries which I'm pretty sure I don't even need to teach you are important because the heart is a muscle, right? It's a very special type of muscle, very unique type of muscle. But like any other muscle, it needs oxygen that's carried through arteries to survive and keep beating. And guess what? You kind of need a heart to keep surviving <laughs> the rest of your body. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the pathways here that some of the major coronary arteries take to orient ourselves, here would be the right ventricle going into the pulmonary trunk, branching into a right and left to go to each lung. Here's our aorta, ascending arch, and then disappearing as the descending. We see a little bit of our right atrium here. We see a little bit of our left atrium. We can actually make out one of the pulmonary veins coming back from the lung into the left atrium here as well. In order to see this path a little bit better, we're gonna cut those off. So we've cut off the left atrium a little bit and we've cut off most of our pulmonary trunk here so that we can see things. And again, this is our aorta. This is our ascending aorta, which means the aortic valve's right about here. And we can see the right coronary artery emanating from that right coronary ostium. We saw it from the inside, where it's being fed with good, freshly oxygenated arterial blood. And here we see it emerging and going along the surface of the heart, the other term for surface being epicardial. And it's going between this little groove that's formed between the right atrium and the right ventricle, called an AV groove or atrioventricular groove. And as it's traveling along that groove, it's giving off little branches to supply, among other things, for example, the right ventricle, which needs to stay alive in order to pump blood into the lungs. On the other side, it's slightly different because we do have a left main coronary artery. We say left main because it's gonna branch into two important branches and it's gonna do so fairly quickly, sometimes like less than a centimeter before it does a very important split. And one of the arteries that splits off of the left main coronary comes down here, the anterior surface of the heart as the left anterior descending artery or LAD. The more anatomical description for this is the anterior interventricular artery, and that's actually a really great name. It's probably more descriptive than LAD is because it's along that interventricular septum that we pointed out in the other image. And so we know where it's going based off of that name. Unfortunately, clinically, we don't really use that term. You'll hear LAD or left anterior descending. So both mean the same thing, but clinically, you're really going to hear it as LAD. And again, it's going to give rise to a lot of branches. As you can see, a lot of these go and supply the left ventricle, making it a very important coronary artery. The other branch of the left main coronary is this one that follows more of a mirrored pathway of the right coronary, just on the left side, 
and that's the circumflex artery. And much like the right coronary artery, it's going along the AV groove, this time just between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And then both the right coronary and circumflex arteries are going around and sort of disappearing from our point of view to the posterior aspect of the heart. So in order to see that continuation, we're gonna flip around to the posterior surface where we see the continuation of the right coronary artery here, still giving rise to branches such as this one at the sort of border between anterior and posterior, we call it the right marginal branch, sometimes also called acute marginal branch. Unfortunately, that's not a great <laughs> description, you know, unless you remember that acute means right, it's kind of better if we use right marginal branch. And then it eventually, although it's a little obscured here from our IVC, it's going to feed into this artery that's going to travel on the posterior aspect of the interventricular septum, hence the anatomic name posterior interventricular. But again, even though that's descriptive, that's more of an anatomy textbook name, it's not really our clinical name, you're usually going to hear PDA or posterior descending artery. So again, posterior and anterior interventricular really gets you honed in on where these are located. You just have to know that they have different, more clinically used names such as LAD or PDA. Now, in this situation, we saw the right coronary supplying this posterior descending artery, but we didn't talk about the left. So that circumflex artery is coming around doing the same thing, giving off branches over on this side, the corresponding left marginal branch or obtuse marginal. So again, acute marginal versus obtuse marginal are terms you may hear. It's just unfortunate that unless you memorize it, you don't know what that means. Right marginal and left marginal, sure. We just have to be aware that they have these synonyms sometimes. But what we see is that in this particular heart, the circumflex artery coming from the left doesn't continue on to form our PDA. And in, instead it's formed by the right coronary artery. And this is the more common arrangement in most human hearts. And we say that it's right dominant. So if you ever hear that term, this is what it means. It means the coronary anatomy is such that the PDA is supplied by the right rather than the left. If it was the opposite and it was supplied by the circumflex, we would say it's a left dominant heart. And as you can imagine, we talk about that because there's clinical significance, right? Because say you have a right dominant heart, well, if you have some sort of occlusion of the right coronary artery, well, that actually is gonna be a lot worse than if it was a left dominant heart because that is the artery that was supplying all of this posterior aspect of the heart. Okay, so that's a very brief kind of overview, um, maybe review, maybe preview, depending on where you are in your anatomy studying. Um, but how does this help us with a differential diagnosis? Like how are we gonna connect these facts of anatomy to real world clinical scenarios? Well, for now, pretty much wherever you are in your training, you want to think of all of the anatomic locations that could possibly be the source of pain. So, you know, we typically tell, for example, first year um, PA and MD students, think very broadly. We want a very, very, very broad differential. We want you to think about as many possible things as you could. Eventually, as you progress through your training, you're going to want to refine your differentials to think about which things are particularly common as well as which things are particularly dangerous, and that helps you prioritize your differential diagnosis a little bit more. And yes, while well, heart is definitely on the di differential diagnosis, especially because of this dangerous part, it's not the only structure that should be on your differential diagnosis. And by the way, I purposely put DDX, just in case some of you haven't seen that shorthand, kind of get you introduced to some of this um, medical shorthand uh, that we don't always describe. So that's just for differential diagnosis. Now, again, we're going to use our clinical history in combination with our anatomy knowledge to help 
us arrive at a diagnosis. Now, we're not going to talk about all of the diagnostic procedures you might go through to really nail a diagnosis. It's really just going to be an overview to connect the anatomy to chest pain. So, here are some clinical histories we'll go over and kind of think about where could we have some anatomic locations that correlate with this pain. We'll start with the one that you probably always want to have on the top of your mind anyway, which is a clinical history or really a presentation that is something like a crushing substernal, meaning deep to the sternum pain also kind of means sort of vaguely localized that radiates out to the shoulder, for example. Well, you know, a single sentence description of a patient's chief complaint is not enough to make a diagnosis, of course. Otherwise, boy, this whole job will be a lot easier. But for today, we're going to say, well, that kind of puts us in that cardiac uh, world where we really want to rule out the cardiac stuff probably first because that's probably the most lethal of the options on our differential diagnosis. And you probably have heard of coronary artery disease as one of those main causes of cardiac chest pain, especially really worrisome, dangerous cardiac chest pain. So if we go back to those coronary arteries we were just looking at and we were to do a cross section we would hope we would see something like this, where we have a widely patent coronary artery where blood's flowing just like it should. And if we really drilled down and looked at the wall of the artery, we would kind of make out there's a thin inner layer, a broad red layer here, and then a thin pink layer on the outside. And those are three layers of the heart that, or sorry, of the intima, thin intima, we have muscle, and then very thin adventitia or outer connective tissue area. And one of the key things when it comes to most forms of coronary artery disease is that that intima is really not much more than a layer of cells called endothelium, which means things just float right over them, things like red blood cells. The problem is when we start to develop atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. As you can see here in the early stages of atherosclerotic cardiac uh, or coronary artery disease, that intima starts to get very thick with this yellowy stuff. Athero means gruel, sort of like this weird oatmealish thing. And it's this gruel of like lipids and macrophages and other things that you'll learn about in your histology or pathology courses. But for our purposes, among other things, the thing we're worried about is the fact that that intima layer is starting to push into the space where blood flows called the lumen. And it gets more and more compressed and we're reducing the ability of blood to flow through there. And where's blood flowing to? Well, the myocardium or the heart muscle that's doing all of the work to supply our body essentially with oxygen, oxygenated blood. So a typical situation as these coronary arteries get very, very narrow is you really have a limitation on the supply side of myocardial oxygenation. So that means if someone has a very narrow coronary artery and then, you know, they realize they're late for their bus and they have to go run and catch their bus, now they have this increase in demand that their supply can't keep up with, they might get angina or chest pain as a result of the ischemia or lack of blood flow to the muscle supplied by this occluded or nearly occluded, we would say stenotic coronary artery. And then even worse, the thing we really worry about probably at the top of our differential with the chest pain is say a piece of this plaque breaks off. That's going to be even worse because now very acutely that can cause the blood in here to clot or form a thrombus. And then instead of having limited supply, you suddenly have no supply to a given region of the heart. And instead of being ischemic, meaning low on oxygen, you have none and you infarct, meaning that tissue necrosis or dies 
from lack of oxygenation. And that's a myocardial infarct or MI or heart attack. And another thing that ties in with the anatomy is, for example, interventional cardiologists will use the knowledge of the coronary uh, artery anatomy to go in to these coronary arteries to find these plaques and deliver a stent with a catheter, which can then be deployed or opened by inflating a little tiny balloon. And as you can see, that pushes open and uh, pushes the plaque away so that you can restore blood flow to these areas that were otherwise compromised by this atherosclerotic plaque. And then you can do things like angiography where you inject a little bit of dye, for example, here at the right coronary ostium and see the dye go all throughout the coronary tree to make sure there's no occlusions there. And that's basically in reverse how you would diagnose something like a, an occlusion in the first place is you would not see all of these branches appear. One of them would be blocked off. And again, you're using your knowledge of how the right coronary, ar coronary artery travels in this AV groove and wraps around to the posterior surface. And you have to know that anatomy pretty well because on these angiography studies, you don't really get to see much besides the coronary arteries because they're the only ones getting this special dye that makes it visible. Okay, now that's, that's a classic thing. When you think chest pain, that's probably the first thing you thought we would be talking about, right? Let's talk about some other things that might present slightly different. And let's say maybe we've ruled out heart attack or cardiac causes of chest pain. We can kind of move down the differential, um, you know, while we've taken care of the most concerning things. Well, let's say we get a different sort of presentation. Let's say there's a sharp stabbing pain that's worse when inhaling or breathing deeply, such as with laughing or coughing. Now that's gonna be pretty different, right? The nature of that complaint, the nature of that pain is, is a little different than the last presentation. And one of the key things we'll focus on is it's worse with inhaling. Well, what's going on with breathing? Well, we already said the diaphragm contracts, the lungs inflate or with oxygen as you breathe in, the diaphragm relaxes, you have elastin in your lungs that forces the CO2 out key thing is the lungs are expanding and contracting, right? And that brings us back to the idea of pleura, right? So we said the pleural cavity has a little bit of pleural fluid to reduce friction in there. So this expansion, contraction, the rubbing of visceral and parietal is a very smooth, frictionless thing. But what if we have inflammation of that pleura, such as pleuritis, say from a viral infection? Well, you can imagine that's something where movement, such as with breathing, is going to irritate it more. And so that is a way to tie in a complaint, a chief complaint or a clinical presentation, a little more with the anatomy. Knowing about the anatomy of the pleura helps us think, oh, you know, that could be something that's pleuritic chest pain. And there are other causes of pleuritic chest pain and other ways you could damage the pleura. For example, if there's trauma that disrupts the parietal pleura and connects it to the outside atmospheric air, well, you could have something called a pneumothorax, a very particular type called a tension pneumothorax, where every time you breathe in, air is going into the pleural cavity instead of the lungs, and therefore you can kind of collapse that lung. Now, that doesn't really fit with kind of our scenarios we're thinking of because, you know, if you have trauma that is creating a space between the pleural cavity and the outside world, they'd probably come in complaining about the knife in their chest rather than saying, I have chest pain. So that'd be a little more obvious. Something a little less obvious would be if they have a spontaneous pneumothorax from a rupture of their lungs a rupture of their visceral pleura, and then air is going out from the inside the lungs into the pleural cavity. And a typical situation for that might be someone who has COPD or emphysema, where they get these thin, dilated cystic air spaces along the surface of the lung called subpleural blebs. It's just what it sounds like. It's a little bleb, just like a little tiny tight balloon right along the surface of the pleura that can rupture spontaneously. 
and again, get another form of pneumothorax, pneumo meaning air. So air in this cavity where you shouldn't have any air, you should typically just have a small amount of fluid. All right, so yet again, a slightly different presentation. Here we're gonna have the pain described as burning, still substernal. So we're like, okay, well, location-wise, that doesn't help me too much, but burning pain and difficulty swallowing. It's like, okay, well, this is a little different than these other two. And now instead of being related to breathing, it's being related to something digestive. So we might think more along the GI system or digestive tract. And we know we really don't have a lot in the chest area that's digestive besides the esophagus. So our minds are probably gonna jump to the esophagus and we're probably gonna jump to this picture we saw where we talked about the lower esophageal sphincter that protects the opening from the esophagus into the stomach. Now the stomach, of course, is not in the chest, it's below the diaphragm and the abdomen, but it's got these different parts. And when you learn about physiology or histology, you'll learn that there's some special types of mucosa or epithelium that are at the very initial and ending parts of the stomach in particular for our purposes, the cardia has some specialized glands and those specialized glands are there because the stomach's full of acid and the esophagus and duodenum on the opposite end are definitely not meant to handle stomach the way the, to, to, uh, sorry, to handle acid the way the stomach is. So at the beginning and ends, we have some specialized tissue to sort of like neutralize things which help in conjunction with the lower esophageal sphincter in this situation to protect the esophagus from acid. Problem is, if that lower esophageal sphincter doesn't close properly, we can get stomach acid going backwards up into the esophagus, something called GERD. You might've heard that term. GERD stands for gastroesophageal reflux disease. And so that reflux of acid up into the esophagus is very damaging because the esophagus is really made for handling mechanical stress. So a chewed food bowl is traveling all the way down to the stomach. It's not adapted to handle acid the way the stomach is. Again, something if you learn the histology of the GI tract will make a lot of sense. But long story short, the stomach is, or sorry, the uh, esophagus is not meant to handle this, and that acid is very damaging, makes it very inflamed, and it can be very painful. And not only can it be painful, but if it's chronic and goes on for a long time, eventually, in a subset of patients, that mucosa is just going to give up and actually turn into a different type of mucosa, go from one epithelium to another type of epithelium, something called metaplasia. And subset of those patients, unfortunately, could be the first step towards carcinoma or a cancer of the epithelium. So these are things happening more on the histologic level, but it's a way to correlate all the way from a, a patient's clinical presentation to anatomy to histology even. But that would be a real common example of GI-related chest pain. And then finally, something that's like even more different, but probably something we would rule everything out first. But what if we have parasternal, para meaning next to the sternum, with tenderness to palpation? That's our fancy word for saying hurts when you touch it. Now that's very different than these other things because these were pains that you know were either poorly localized or could not be directly palpated or touched because they were deep. They were in the chest cavity, right? Well, when you can palpate it, that's actually kind of a good sign when it comes to chest pain because what are the things we can palpate or touch? Well, we're going back to that outer chest wall when we talked about the sternum and the costal cartilages. Well, these costal cartilages form little joints with the sternum sternochondral joints. Chondral is just another word for cartilage. And same thing where that costal cartilage 
meets the ribs, sort of a costochondral joint. Again, just means rib cartilage joint. You could have, say, costochondritis, inflammation of these joints. And again, inflammation of these joints being a more musculoskeletal issue rather than GI or respiratory or cardiac is something you can actually touch. You can localize the pain very well and you can reproduce it with palpation on a physical exam. And fortunately, that's something that's going to be less worrisome than all the other ones and gonna be something that once you ruled out the scary things, you can kind of get down to this level and hopefully find that it's in this area that corresponds with their pain and the way they described it. So in summary, because we're uh, running at low on time here, we're going to always keep in mind all of the anatomy and basically break up our differential at first by anatomic location. And again, as you get further into these conditions, you're gonna start sorting them by the seriousness of the conditions. For example, myocardial infarction, and well, a lot of those cardiovascular ones are very serious, very, very potentially uh, life-threatening. Pulmonary, there are various things that are gonna be more life-threatening than others. Some are a little more slow, some are a little more emergent, like a pulmonary embolism. And then some are going to be lower on the differential, even if they're common causes of chest pain, such as a costochondritis, for example. So you're going to eventually combine your anatomic knowledge with the conditions that are related to these anatomies by how serious they are. And again, knowing your chest anatomy is, is the foundation for all of this, even though you're gonna get into the pathology of these things and how to work them up and eventually how to treat them, of course, they're really gonna be rooted in knowing everything that's in that space between the neck and the abdomen. And that means not all chest pain is going to be cardiac pain. That's an important part of it, but it's not the full story. And again, even then, you're going to sort things eventually into the things that scare you the most to the things that scare you the least. And I think I will hand that over to Nurse Liz. That's the last thing that I have.